about whales and we have known for a long time that we've had an economic dependence on whales and that goes from whaling um, which was a huge economic impact in this country for a long time and in fact we killed nearly three million whales just in the 20th century alone um, to now whale watching and whale watching is so important now that it's valued at over two billion dollars as a global industry but something happened in 1972 where at least in the United States, we decided that whales weren't just important to us economically, but that they also had value to us aesthetically and recreationally. And that's when the US Congress passed something called the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It was groundbreaking legislation because it protect all marine mammals in the US regardless of their status. It did something that no other country had ever done before and it valued whales in a very different way. It made sure that we weren't just killing them on purpose anymore, but something else that was really amazing about this is it actually made sure we weren't killing them by accident, or at least not too many of them. And when I say by accident, what I'm talking about is when they accidentally get caught in fishing gear, or when they're accidentally run over by passing vessels. In fact, the Marine Mammal Protection Act includes a mathematical formula, and I'm sure nobody told you there was gonna be math, but there is. Um, it's called PBR and it's a threshold and it makes sure that we're not killing too many whales of a species within a particular population by accident. If we exceed this threshold, the Marine Mammal Protection Act says that we're supposed to do something about it. We're supposed to intervene and help. And that's a really, really cool, amazing thing. What I'm going to tell you though is that maybe it doesn't go quite far enough. Because what this mathematical formula doesn't do is it doesn't tell you if the whale that was killed was male or female. It doesn't tell you if it was an adult or if it was a juvenile. And perhaps even more importantly, it doesn't tell you who it was. This particular formula treats whales as interchangeable. It says that all the whales that are in that population of that species are pretty much all of equal value, that they're all the same. But as we look more and more, and we kind of go a little bit more in depth into looking at whales, what we're finding is that they're not all interchangeable that different whales play unique roles within their societies, that they have, they have societies, and that they have culture. This is Salt. Um, she's probably one of the most famous whales in the North Atlantic. She was the first whale named in the Gulf of Maine. She, we know her because of these unique markings on her fluke. She's taught researchers lots and lots and lots of things about humpback whales. She's taught us where they migrate to from this population. She's taught us how many calves they can have, or she's continuing to teach us that. She's taught us how frequently they can have calves. Um, eventually, she might help us figure out how old they can live to be. And one of the things she's doing right now is she's teaching us about whale culture. And not because of something she's doing, but actually because of something she doesn't do. Salt was born over 40 years ago in the Caribbean. And now a mom of 14, grandmother of 14, great-grandmother too. She's still having calves of her own. She returns to the waters off New England each spring and she feeds there in the spring, summer, and fall because that's where her mom brought her. And that's where she brought her children. And that's now where her children come up every year. That's where her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren all come up to feed. She taught her children how to get there. She taught her children how to find food once they were there. She taught them what to eat, and she even taught them perhaps how to collect that food. But something she did not teach them was a very specific behavior called kick feeding. And it's a behavior that's only found in this one particular tribe, this one particular society of humpback whales in the world. It's the only place that you can see it. Sea salt is a baleen whale. She's a humpback whale. And if I can get this to work, humpback whales don't have teeth. They have this baleen that hangs down from their upper jaw. She's probably between 40 and 50 feet long and she weighs around 80,000 pounds. She does not eat one fish at a time. Large baleen whales need to eat lots and lots and lots of fish at once. They have to eat about a ton of food a day. What she eats is a tiny little fish, tiny small 
schooling fish. And the southern Gulf of Maine, she usually feeds on this kind of fish. It's called a sand eel or a sand lance. So she learned how to collect it, and she taught her kids how to do that. What she did, though, is she's super old school. She does something called the bubble cloud or a bubble net. And so what you'll see is the water turn a little bit green, and it's turning kind of green because of phytoplankton, which we'll talk about in a little while. And you can see her come up here. So the thought is if the fish perceive that bubble, basically those bubbles is a barrier they can't get through. And so it schools the fish into a night nice place so that she can get more for a mouthful. It's a great technique. That's what she does. This is kind of collecting sand lance 101. So this is 1.0. But some whales have taken this to a new level. And they're feeding on sand lance 2.0. And feeding on sand lance 2.0 is a behavior called kick feeding. Salt does not kick feed. So some whales in the 1980s figured out that if you kick the water surface first, before you form that bubble cloud, you can stun the fish and really kind of concentrate them. There was an innovator in the society. Researchers in 1980 said that they didn't see any whales doing this. By 1990, half the whales that they were watching out there did it. But what was kind of cool and remarkable is that the moms of the kick feeders didn't kick feed. They didn't learn this from their mothers. They learned it from their friends. It was shared and culturally transmitted through a peer group. So some whale was an innovator enough to have tried this and figure it out. In other whales, there was the trendsetter and then there were the trend followers who picked up on it and then shared it throughout the population. So this is kind of feeding on sand lance 2.0. Salt, however, like I said, this is her family tree here with her 14 kids and her 14 grandkids and the two grand calves that we know of right now. She doesn't kick feed, but her son, Crystal, I, I know it's a girl's name, but it's her son. Um, so her son, Crystal, her daughter, Thalassa, her granddaughter, Etch-a-Sketch, they're all kick feeders. Well, whale naming's a whole nother talk. Um, <laughs> but, but they kick feed, they didn't learn that from salt. They learned it from each other. They learned it from their friends. That's a way that we think of, or we can think of culture when you want to think of cultural transmission, is learning things from your friends, not just from your parents. That you're sharing those, those ideas, kind of, kind of like doing these talks, you share ideas with, with a peer group. Think of it from musical perspectives. So the generational changes, we heard some music this morning, there's generational changes that happen in music. The musical tastes of my parents did not necessarily become my own. And my misspent youth listening to rock groups, and I learned that from my friends. And what the latest bands were out there that I wanted to listen to, that was something that I shared with my friends. I promise you that I did not impart a love of country music on my children. They got that from their friends. And that's cultural transmission. That's generational changes that happen when you have peer groups share ideas. That happens in whale behavior. So this is Samara, and she's a pretty standard kick feeder. She's gonna kick twice. Can watch her get ready there, and there's the first kick. That's her calf with her. So her calf might learn this technique, but might also change it, and there's the second kick. She'll then dive down and she'll form her bubbles. That's pretty typical, standard 2.0 kick feeding. But as we dig a little bit deeper, what we're seeing is that 3.0 might be around the corner and that this behavior itself is changing and that whales are kind of testing out new ways of doing it. And so as we're starting to dig into this a little bit more, we're trying to figure out which of these techniques is going to take off. Who is the next innovator? Who are the, who are the next group of trend followers that are brave enough to try it and share it throughout the population? This is Fulcrum. She's going to kick three times. Now that's not so typical, most of them will do two, but you've got three kicks here, so right before she goes down, she's gonna give a little extra kick. And there it is. That's more energetically expensive, it takes more energy to do that, but is that better? Does that help to stun the fish a little bit more? Is this the new technique that we're gonna start to see taking off? Or is it gonna be reflection? Reflection does something called a chin slap breach before she kicks. She does the two kicks, but if we watch it again, she's going to stick her face out of the water, and she's actually going to slap her chin down on the water, and then she's going to do her two kicks. Is that going to be the technique that takes off? Is this sand lance feeding 3.0? It's possible that that chin slap might bring the fish toward her tail and might make that a more effective way of feeding. 
It's something that we're trying to look at now. It's going to take a while to figure this out, but certainly we're starting to see these changes. Now, Tornado. Tornado's a little bit trickier because she does this chin slap breach, but really quickly you can see her flipper stick out of the water first. So we'll watch it again and just watch right here. There's her flipper. And so she sticks her flippers out before she does that chin slap breach. So is this the 3.0 technique of feeding? Because we do know that the flippers have the white under the side and they can also work as a startle mechanism for the fish. So is she helping to school the fish even in a better way to bring them underneath her, move them down with her head, then slap them with her tail? Or, or is she just like me and has a little bit of a balance problem and she might need that extra help? We don't know, but we're going to look to see if this behavior starts to kind of take off. Is this something a little bit better, maybe than bubble clouds, maybe than just regular kick feeding? This is Ventisca. I have no doubt she's an innovator, but I don't think she's a trendsetter. Her little bit of a sloppy, floppy kind of way of kicking that, I'm not guessing that's going to take off. But the fact that she's trying something different is kind of cool that they're kind of taking these different ways of, of figuring stuff out, that there's thought put into it, that there's innovation, and that they're sharing that, and that the friends are picking it up and it's transmitting throughout the population. We don't know who the innovators are. We don't always know who the trendsetters are. We don't necessarily know who the trend followers are, those brave group who kind of take and will try that, like the first people that maybe were like trying Netflix and then it took off. It's, it's that kind of thing. We don't know who's doing that, but we know that they're important. We know that they serve this incredibly important role within these societies. And the reason that it's important is because this behavior of kick feeding seemed to coincide with a shift in prey. It went from herring, which were largely being overfished, to these sand lance, which aren't so commercially valuable. So some whales figured out this was an alternate prey source. Some whales figured out that this was a better way to collect it. In an environment where we have whales facing a rapidly changing climate, potentially having to exploit new prey sources, we need those innovators. We need those risk takers to go out there and figure something out. We need those trend followers to share it with the rest of the population because that's what's going to keep these populations healthy. And so why do you care about this? You care about it because not only do we know whales are aesthetically pleasing, that they are economically important, that they're recreationally important. We're starting to understand now that they are ecologically important. We need them for our own survival. Whales play an incredibly important key role in the ecosystem that we're just starting to understand. And it all comes back to a small, tiny microscopic organism that most of you will never see. And it's called phytoplankton. And that's kind of what made those green bubble clouds look kind of greenish. Phytoplankton forms a free-floating ocean forest in the sunlit waters. It floats around and it photosynthesizes. Just like plants on land, it uses the sun's energy and some nutrients. It takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It gives off oxygen. It makes food for itself. It actually makes at least half of the air that you breathe. It is the very base of the marine food web. Sustainable fish stocks depend on lots of phytoplankton and, and healthy phytoplankton stocks. Because it takes the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and it gives off the oxygen, it keeps that carbon with them. Now, phytoplankton have a very short but very fulfilling life. They live about two days. And they are literally carbon sinks. They take that carbon with them and they sink to the ocean bottom. So they are helping to regulate this climate. We need them to help to fight climate change. We need phytoplankton. What phytoplankton need are whales. You see, phytoplankton can't root into the soil the way that plants on land can. So they have to have their nutrients brought to them. And that's where whales come into the picture. Whales literally serve this incredibly important role as the ocean gardeners. And they tend that forest of phytoplankton. And the way they do it is maybe not the best dinner talk, but the way they do it is because they can't poop under pressure. And it's not the pressure of like maybe somebody's waiting outside the bathroom door. <laughs> it's the physical atmospheric pressure of being at depth. So bathroom breaks happen at the surface. Those bathroom breaks are full of nitrogen and iron and these amazing nutrients that the phytoplankton need. They tend that ocean forest when they come up to the surface and they feed. 
and they're coming up and they're using those bathroom breaks. Phytoplankton need whales, they need the nutrients. If we want to fight climate change, if we want sustainable fish stocks, if we want to breathe, we want whales to be healthy. Healthy populations of whales need a healthy society. They need to consider the individuals that live within that society and that the roles that they play. The way that we're managing whales now doesn't do that. It treats whales as interchangeable. So we have a threshold, a mathematical formula, that looks at whales and says, well, maybe there's too many in this population that are being killed. But I'm telling you that we need to think about who they are and that there really can't be a threshold. We need a healthy society of whales because we depend on them. The way that we are doing things now is that we're managing things in a way for whales to survive, which is great. But we need whale populations to thrive, not just survive. And to thrive, we need to protect their cultures because our very future and our survival may depend on it. Thank you.